Fellas, say goodbye to Chuck Sherman the boy. I am now a man. I highly recommend you join the club. We are doing the wild thing all night. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Sherm. Sherman. I could build this food. Then all you gonna eat? General Sherman realized and understood the importance of house music. So, do you know anything about techno? No. Listen. Get it on. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another brand new episode of Sherm in the Booth. I'm, of course, your host, Sherm. Today is Wednesday, February 26, 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, you already know this is episode 100. Make some noise out there. Woo, yeah, all right. Holy shit, 100. Congratulations, right? I know. It's crazy. What an incredible journey this has been. I started Sherman the Booth in September 2016. Here we are, February 2020. I've got no plans of stopping now, which is why the episodes are listed with three digits, right? I knew when I did episode 001, I would continue to do it, but I have to say there's been a lot of obstacles I've had to overcome, a lot of moments of doubt, but everyone's support, no matter how big or small, has meant everything, and it's why I continue to do this. So I do want to say from the bottom of my heart, Thank you so much to everybody that supported the podcast and been on the podcast. It means the world. Now, this episode, guys, we switched it up and interviewed myself. I had so much fun with this episode, and I really have never told my door-to-door story, so it was really, really fun. I know you guys are going to enjoy it, so let's get into it right now. This is episode 100100 featuring Sherm. Thank you, guys. Okay, Sherm. Hey. You made it, man. Episode 100. How does it feel? Tell us, huh? I honestly cannot believe we're here. It's been such a long journey, but all the hard work has paid off. I started the podcast September 2016, and it's been an incredible journey. I just want to say thank you to everybody that has supported me from episode 001 all the way to 100. We're never going to stop, so thank you. I appreciate it, and I'm glad to be on the show. So, we usually start the podcast with your journey so far, man, but take us from it. Day one to today, huh? Tell us, where did you start and where are you now? Well, damn, that's a really good question, Sherm. Seems like you really know what you're doing. Um, It's been a crazy journey. Um, I guess I'll start at the beginning. You know, growing up, my mom and dad, they didn't really play any instruments, but I was listening to Bruce Springsteen, Journey, all that sort of rock, you know, when you're driving to soccer practice and your mom puts on a song and you hate it, but you really sing all the words. That was always Thunder Road for me. So shout out to my mom and Bruce Springsteen. Uh, rock and roll has always been a part of my life. So that's when music really kind of started to affect me and my uh, behavior, who I was and everything about me. Uh, it's been an integral part of my life ever since then. Electronic music didn't really come around until high school for me. Um, I remember so specifically, I was at a homecoming uh, after party at my friend's house, and we were playing a bunch of, you know, old school rap, 90s, early 2000s, that type of stuff. And one of my friends put on Warp 1.9 by the Bloody Beat Roots and Steve Aoki, and he turned it up all the way. And this person had a really, really loud speaker system. It was kind of like a home entertainment system. We were all pretty drunk. Yes, mom, dad, I was underage drinking, but it was in a safe environment, you know, keys in the bowl type thing. And he put on Warp 1.9, and I remember the drop. Like, the buildup was, and I was like, what the fuck is going on? Kept going, kept going, drop comes. You know, when you're drunk in high school, you got the vodka head, it's really warm. I was fucking taken back. Like, what the hell is this? We listened to it like five or six times in a row, and I had never experienced something like that. And a lot of times, you know, when I interview people on the podcast, it's at a festival or, you know, at a club or something where they're like, wow, this is what it's all about. And I had such this like raunchy, raw experience in someone's basement, and I think it kind of developed the foundation of my love for it because I always liked that intimate, authentic vibe. and. Every time I go to a show, that thought always comes up. When I was in the basement with all my friends and we're going crazy to this song we've never heard before. So much energy. Um, And that same friend actually introduced me to Dead Mouse. And I gotta give a shout out to this friend too. His name is James Summers. He lives in New York City. Um, He's an incredible guy and he showed me so much music. Um, But he showed me Brazil by Dead Mouse. I remember we were 
driving back after losing a lacrosse game so badly. And he was like, I got the song for us, man. We're going to forget about this shit. He puts on Brazil Dead Mouse, and it's funny because Brazil Dead Mouse is totally the opposite of Bloody Beetroot's Warp 1.9. But I felt like I kind of understood the breadth of electronic music. It was like, wow, there's all these different things in between genre wise. And now he's showing me Dead Mouse, right? And that song's like seven and a half minutes long. So we listened to the whole damn thing, and I just remember thinking after he dropped me off, like, forgetting everything that had happened that day, that week, I just went into another world, and as cliche as that sounds, it really is the truth. So after that, that was my senior year, I went to college at IU, um, this was in 2011, and it was the height of the EDM boom. I remember the year before I went to IU, they, have, they were bringing in huge DJs, huge rappers, they had like Lil Wayne, Rick Ross, Nicki Minaj, they were bringing in some other big DJs as well, but I really wasn't as into the electronic music. We come to school, Levels comes out by Avicii, and that shit rocked the fucking world, let alone Bloomington, Indiana, McNutt, dorm room, Bordner, shout out Dom Dam. Um, but I remember what that song did to parties. I mean, whenever I think about music production now, I think about what that song does, and the best way to produce any sort of music is people to be able to remember it, hum along to it, right? So, da na 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 da na 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 And when that song came on at parties, everybody fucking got as high as they possibly could on a table or on a chair, on people's shoulders, whatever it might be, and just went crazy. And I'd never seen electronic music shared energy like that, right? So I just could not believe it. And I remember after that song started coming out, um, I was pretty into electronic music at that point, like obsessive, I would say, uh, just looking for big drops. I was so into Big Room, hilarious thinking back. I would skip the buildups and the breaks and just go straight to the drops, straight to the fucking drops every single time, just looking for the biggest drops. And I just couldn't, I couldn't compare the energy to anything else. So I was like, all right, well, I really like this drop. And I think it'd be cool to pair it up with this vocal. So I downloaded Virtual DJ. And mind you, I didn't have any friends that were DJing or really that into electronic music. My friend James, who was like my closest friend and that I always shared new music with and stuff, he went to another school on the East Coast. And luckily it was really becoming popular. So I was able to show a lot of people this music that I was discovering. But I remember we would be in my dorm room and I'd be in the corner connected to two desktop speakers and I was just doing volume in and out fades of songs and my friends and I had never really done anything like that, let alone seen someone DJ. So we were all pretty amazed. I was pretty amazed. It wasn't very good. In fact, I came across a mix that I made. It was so fucking bad. I didn't delete it. I'm never gonna share it, but I'm always gonna remember it. And I just remember that I had sort of control of this energy. And that's when I really started to realize, I was like, man, like DJing is awesome. But I didn't immediately start like, okay, I wanna become a DJ. I just became really into going to shows. Um, I started uh, going to a lot more shows in the Midwest, Chicago specifically. I went to Spring Awakening, I think it was 2013. This is when I was in Soldier Field. That was a really next level experience for me. It was so inspiring. I mean, to go there with all the people, downtown Chicago, right? I'm from a little town called Zionsville, Indiana, and Soldier Field Spring Awakening main stage is pretty much North Pole, South Pole. So to see that and feel that was next level. And it's so funny because a lot of people I've had on the podcast were at that same festival at a similar timeline. And it's so crazy to talk to someone or reminisce with someone on that specific event because it was so substantial at that point in time. It was really a foundation and I would almost say battlegrounds for a lot of the DJs today. I was looking at the lineup actually recently. Lewis the Child was a, a little name on there, Boombox Cartel, so many other guys and now these types of people are you know selling out the Aragon. Lewis the Child is headlining Coachella and um, to look back and think where I was now or where I was then to where I am now is really really inspiring because it's tangible right to actually talk to these types of people and know all the steps that they had to take. Um, and that's only in retrospect now. So the journey continued throughout college. I went abroad. 
uh, to Barcelona, Barcelona, uh, a broad kid right here, I guess, you know, whatever you want to say. Um, but it really was next level for me. I visited 13 different countries. I went to um, so many different shows. I went to Manchester uh, to see Hardwell, a victorious uh, warehouse, one of the craziest venues I've ever been to. Um, I saw so many shows in Barcelona. It was the first I had gotten a taste of like, this is the culture rather than this is a party. So for those who don't know about Barcelona, everybody starts things later there. And the party doesn't start until 2 a.m., right? And I'm going out with all these American people. We're pre-gaming at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. We're getting to the, the club at 12. There's nobody fucking there. And I'm just like, what the hell is going on? Where is everybody? 2 o'clock, all these Spanish people start coming in. Party is popping at 3.30 in the morning. And I'm still pretty tired from that experience, I'd like to think. But it showed me that it's more than a festival at Spring Awakening. It's more than my dorm room with my friends. Like People live this life. It is part of their daily routine. The culture in Barcelona was, sorry, Barcelona, um, was really next level, like I said. And it was so crazy because I was really experiencing actually from the eyes of Spanish people. I was there with a lot of friends from college and people I knew, but I wasn't in the same day program as them with school. So I was in a lot more, um, you know, Spanish immersed classes and only would try and speak Spanish with my roommates um, who, are, who are still some of my really good friends. Shout out to Eli and Nick. It's actually funny because this time of the year on Time Hop, is all of our funny ass stories and times and adventures in Barcelona. And it's just so crazy to reconnect with them year round, but also like, do you remember this seven years ago? So shout out to them. They were such a huge influence on me, but mostly the local scene there, you know, I was out um, really trying to understand what it's like to be a part of this music culture, electronic music. And I, I remember my parents came to visit me maybe with like two months left and they always love telling this story. We get in the car, we get in the cab, I just drop some fucking lingo on this guy. He talks to me, we're talking, we're laughing. My dad and mom are like, who the fuck is this guy? Talking Spanish to the cab driver, right? And we're going around the city. I remember somebody stopped and asked me for directions and I nailed the directions. And I just like felt this whole new side of me and it wasn't like oh I, I I'm a Spanish guy right like this is what I want to be but I realized that by really going outside my comfort zone um, and meeting new people and introducing myself and trying to hear new types of music I really discovered this other side of me so when I came back my senior year in college I had this this newfound desire and urge to really like give that experience to other people so while I was abroad, I was still wanting to DJ, right? Like I wasn't actually DJing, but I was downloading a ton of music um, because when I got back, I was like, I'm gonna immediately buy a controller, a DJ controller. And shout out to another one of my friends, Chaitan Sharma. Uh, I DJed his wedding in India. This guy sold me my first controller. And it like was the first step to really becoming a DJ and loving it, right? I was doing bedroom festivals that entire summer. And then what I did when I got to back to IU that senior year, it was crazy because this was like shit was popping, right? And I was a senior at this point. I had met a lot of people and one of the DJs shouted this guy, Matt Mulwick, he gave me an opportunity. I still remember my first set. It was 9 p.m. to 9.45. I opened for, I think it was Milk and Cooks. Shout out Milk and Cooks. And I remember still thinking like, this is the best shit I've ever played in my life. And I still do think that because I had like 25 friends come out at 9 p.m. and I just continued to kind of build that momentum through the rest of the year. I started throwing frat parties. We booked Audi and I was like kind of running the backstage and DJed myself and brought in all the audio, all the gear. So I was really getting this behind the scenes look as well, um, not just like the guy who comes up and plugs his USB in. So things really picked up there at the end of the year. I had great opportunities um, and got a real taste, right? But I was spoiled as fuck. I mean to really only be DJing your first year and play with Capslap, Audion, Blau. I mean, so many other people came in, right? And I would be on this lineup with them and it's college kids, right? Like you go to this bar or you go to this bar or you go to this bar. Well, just come to this bar tonight instead of that bar. So like tons of people would be at my shows and it was wild. It was so fucking wild. 
And then I graduate, and I'm like, we got to get to Chicago. You know, I, I want to keep this, this ball rolling. I didn't want to stay in Indiana. Um, I loved where I grew up. I loved all my friends, and I had a lot of uh, close people in my life stay in Indianapolis, but I wanted to go to Chicago. So I moved there with my best friend, Dom Dam, and we got an apartment downtown. I started working at a logistics job because I was like, all right, you know, I got to pay the bills, but I'm still going to try and keep DJing. And then the double life started. Um, I'm still working at the same company. Uh, low delivered logistics has been um, such an incredible experience for me from a personal responsibility perspective, from a relationship management. I mean, I'm making cold calls at this job, right? I do business development management. So little did I know the skills that I was getting from that job applied directly to podcasting. Now to kind of connect the podcast um, I've always been really passionate about radio and television personality. I studied telecommunications in college um, with a focus on production, right? So I did a lot of short films. I did a lot of um, media and editing and post-production and screenwriting and all that sort of stuff. So at first, I wanted to be like a, a director or a writer, and um, that just wasn't really going to pay the bills, and it wasn't exactly the lane that I wanted to go. I didn't want to go to Los Angeles and try and live my life there and stuff like that. So I was like, all right, what can I do? I'm a year into Chicago. It's really hard to meet people here. I'm just some fucking guy from Indiana who says he's open for Caps Lab, right? And that's great and that's awesome and I had a cool resume, but it's so competitive in this city. So I did what I do best and I went up and I introduced myself to people. I went to shows by myself, I tried to network, I did this, I did that, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I met a lot of awesome people at the same time too, right? But the biggest thing that made a difference for me was the second that I started doing the podcast, I separated myself from other DJs and other producers. And I still credit that to be the reason that I've had all the success is because I'm not the best DJ, I'm not the best producer, and I'm not even saying I'm the best podcaster. But I'm saying in a market where there's so many DJs and so many producers, that means that there's all the more people that want to tell their story, that want to be interviewed, that want to talk about their music, that want to talk about their shows, that want to talk about their journey. And I kind of applied the experience from Barcelona to that, right? Like I wanted people to talk about their journey, similar to what I had and what other people heard me out as. So things just started kind of connecting the podcast, <laughs> I remember the first like 10 episodes, right? Jesus Christ. I spent so much time trying to do this. So it started off as I was going to do mixes and I was going to talk over and do stupid commentary, right? Whatever I wanted to do. If you listen back to episode one and you listen to this episode right now, it is wild how different I sound. It wasn't that I wasn't self-confident. It wasn't that I didn't know what I was doing. It wasn't that I wasn't sure that I wanted to pursue this, it was that I just like was new to it, right? So again, I was going outside my comfort zone. And I remember my roommate, he like came in to ask me something, he didn't know I was doing the podcast. I got like the air conditioning off, right? It's like the middle of the summer or September, right? So it started in September, it was so hot. And I didn't want to have any background noise because I'm recording off a little mic that I plugged into my phone. I would plug it into my phone, I would listen on my headphones over a transition that I did, right? So I hand mixed these, these mixes. I would lay it out. <laughs> Episodes took me like 15 hours, sometimes. Now they take me two, right? Um, and I remember I'm in there, I'm sweating fucking dick. Like pit stains down to my fucking underwear. I'm trying so hard to say the perfect thing, not even have like a little bit of like a, st a stumble, whatever it was, right? I cared so much about trying to put my best forward. And I realized that it wasn't as natural as I wanted it to be. And I was like, okay, I need to incorporate um, interviews, right? Like I do want to talk to people. I do want to get my name out there to their network and vice versa. And that's when things really started to pick up. So some of the early episodes um, featured close friends of mine, Tony Ferrara, he was doing this thing called Hypno Disco. We talked a lot about the emotional connection with music and what it means from a mental health perspective. That was awesome. Um, I interviewed uh, someone who's my very close friend now and has been a, a huge mentor for me, even though he's younger than me, his name's Isaac Palmer. That guy has changed my life in so many ways. Um, but I shot him a message, this was you know three and a half years ago. He had this really awesome remix that popped off on Spinning. Um, it's like Spinning Records 
kind of like rising stars. I saw this, I messaged him, I saw that he had a cleft palate, which my brother had as well, and cleft palate is really tough for a kid growing up, lots of operations. Isaac and I connected on that, and it's when I realized that, you know, I thought this kid was like, he is big, right? But I was like, no way this guy's gonna respond to me, right? He responded, we connected, and it's so special to really, really get an in-depth look at people that you may never have the opportunity to unless you do something like this. So that was really, really uh, a game changer for me mentally because at first I was like, all right, you know, I wanna do my, I wanna showcase my personality. So I'll do these funny things. I'll talk about industry. I'll do this, I'll do that. I was doing would you rathers, <laughs> like would you rathers. Not a bad idea, but like, shut the fuck up, Sherm. So I uh, started thinking, all right, who can I serve? How can I have people on the podcast, like I said, to um, not only give them a platform, but are there people, other younger DJs, are there people who have other similar health concerns, are there people who don't know this type of music and want to understand more from a production standpoint? So I started to dive a lot deeper. I started to take a lot more chances on people I didn't know. And that's when my network really started to grow. And that's when I started getting more gigs as well because it's really hard to go into the scene by yourself with no previous connections, right? Like when I think about Indianapolis and Zionsville, it's so much different than like Naperville and Chicago, right? Just in terms of how many people are in the scene here, right? So there was a lot of old, old friends that were kind of not running the scene, but hey, I remember you, you know this person, you know this person, I didn't know fucking anybody. So once I started doing that, I was, you know, rotating on news feeds, right? And ever since then, I've kind of just been rotating in people's social media. And over the course of the last three years, so many people have come to me and complimented me on the podcast, bring up a random quote, a random story. And I was like, damn, like, this is what I'm doing it for. I'm doing it because I wanna just make sure that not only, again, am I giving this person who I'm talking to a chance, but also people who may be holding on to something they wanna either release or learn more about. So that's when I was like, damn, all right, here's the point of the podcast. I wanna give people an opportunity to tell their story. I would say things really started to pick up for me uh, from a DJing perspective, from a podcasting perspective, honestly, a, a year ago. Um, I wanna give a big shout out to James Estrada and Eric Estrada. I believe it was episode 38. Um, James messaged me and I knew who AO was, right? Cause like, I'm trying to like, look, I'm like studying, I'm looking at festival lineups, I'm looking at like who the mid is putting on their local lineups. Like, I'm thinking like, all right, like, here's this tier, here's this tier, let me just like give a shot to middle ones. James messages me, he said, hey man, you know, I saw this person on the podcast, I know him from this, uh, me and my brother would really love to come on. And I'm like, Ayo's reaching out to me, god damn, like I just saw they opened up for uh, bro hug at the mid, and I'm like, shit, okay, this is pretty cool. Um, and then James introduced me to the Be Nice Collective, uh, I absolutely love those guys. I could go on forever. I've had every single one of them on the show. I did a, a whole back-to-back -back session with them. They were incredibly influential to me because they were young guns in the scene, working harder than so many people that I had ever met. We had this mutual respect for each other. So they really opened up um, another level of the scene for connections for me. So I had them all on. Then I started to um, get a lot better at producing. So I felt more confident to bring on more talented people and I could really get granular with them in regards to music theory, um, obviously sound design, plugins, everything. So that picked up a lot too. I remember um, having Max Quinones on. Um, great guy, shout out to Max. And w before I even continue, I wanna say every single person I've had on the podcast is extremely special in their own way and that's why I had them on. And I know I'm not gonna mention everybody, right? Because I think I've had probably 80 people on, right? But um, I just wanna mention that. So Max Quinones, great producer, right? And it was such a fun conversation with him because I was learning, he was learning. I was starting to kind of Joe Rogan people, right? Like I'm remembering shit that I interviewed a year ago 
someone mentioning this to me and I'm starting to bring up random things. And the reason I think Joe Rogan is the best is because he operates on facts of experts. So it's not just some people bullshitting behind a camera with some microphones, right? This is real accurate information. So I realized that, oh shit, man, like I'm starting to become sort of a, an information box. And the only way I can start to share that is if I have these deeper conversations, right? So I was like, okay, let's get 60 minute style on this shit. Let's talk about obstacles people have overcome. Let's talk about, um, you know, what was the biggest influence in their life at a young age? Let's talk timeline with these people, right? So I started to get really, really deep with people. And that's when these amazing friendships started to spur. Um, a huge milestone for me as well, again, with the DJing. Episode 50 just so happened to land um, the Tuesday or Wednesday after I played North Coast in 2018. So, like, I'm not that much of a religious person, but I knew that fucking meant something. Um, and that, I'm feeling emotional talking about this, um, that was crazy. So, the timeline of that was just like, fuck, dude, all right, you gotta keep going, man. You gotta keep going. And mind you, look, everything wasn't perfect. When I was doing this shit, I was by myself, right? Like I was organizing these interviews, I was editing these interviews, I was balancing my day job, I was trying to DJ, I was trying to produce. There were so many times where I said, I don't need to do this. Like there's so many people I know that seem happy, that not take the easy way out, right? But like aren't doing a million things like I thought I was. And there were little wins along the way. Someone reaching out to me like AO, playing North Coast for episode 50, um, and some other big ones that I'll talk about here in a sec, but it's the little things that keep you going. So if you are ever in a situation where you wanna give up and you're gonna continue in anything creatively and anything with entrepreneurship, you're gonna face obstacles that are gonna kick you in the balls and stab you in the eyes with needles. But you gotta go to the fucking doctor and find a way to continue on. And that's what I did. I just kept working and I started to become a better DJ. I played a lot of open format gigs and I started to diversify my portfolio with the artists as well. I got into some different verticals of industries. Um, I interviewed one of my friends, his name's Bobby Hayes. He works at Campus Pro Team. We talked a lot about health and wellness. Another one of my friends, Andre Tate, personal trainer. So I was kind of trying like a lot of different things, right? I'm, I'm, things that I'm passionate about. Continued to really build up the brand. I was I was cleaning things up. If you look at like the cover arts that I fixed, holy shit, there were fucking a lot going on, right? But when the game really, really changed was when I started having these impersonal one-on-one -on -one conversations with the cameras. Um, I felt myself go into another zone, right? I was still myself, but it was like I was thinking so clearly and I just felt something click. I can't remember exactly what episode it was, um, but I had a really good conversation and I just remember afterwards, I was like, damn, like not only was that an incredible interview, but I feel like I'm getting a lot out of this, right? So I feel like I was trying to do so much for this for the other person without really being like thankful for them giving me their time. And it wasn't that I was never thankful. I just started thinking about it differently. And more big gigs started to come and things just started clicking, right? My production was on point. I was um, getting more plays, got it on Spotify. We were on SoundCloud, iTunes. Once things hit, sh hit with YouTube, I was like, bang, like this is fucking for real. Um, I remember in May, uh, last year, I was with my now manager, Tony, and it was kind of funny because we were like walking back for some after party and, I, and we're just like not saying anything for like 30 seconds. And <laughs> I just look at him, he looks at me. And I was like, D I listen, I need you to manage me. <laughs> he goes, I was waiting for that. And since the second he's come on, shit has taken uh, just 10 steps forward, right? He's my fucking cameraman. He's looking at me right now. So I'm not supposed to do that because it's out of character. But um, to have someone come onto your team and believe in what you do without them being able to make money off you and, you know, any sort of what could be considered backstabbing, right? Like I'm still what I would consider to be 
a middle tier guy, right? Like there are a lot of people in the game that are better podcasters, have bigger artists, right? But I just know their journey started somewhere similar to mine. And for someone like Tony, who was a very successful entrepreneur, um, to believe in me and see that one, I ain't gonna quit, and two, this might be something special if we can develop a partnership, um, was really, really huge for me. So it made me kick into another high gear. This motherfucker had me doing episodes every single week. I was tired all the time, but I got into this routine and we just started churning shit out. And once we started churning shit out, um, things really picked up. I had some awesome guests that people that I didn't think would be on the show, um, like Steve Gerard was was really awesome. To go to the music garage in this guy's studio, I looked up to this guy, I've seen this guy DJ a million times. That was a really special interview. Tony set that up. Um, some other big guys, I mean, King Arthur, uh, was a really, really special interview for me. He is from Zionsville, Indiana. I followed this guy for a better part of uh, you know a decade and book him from Chicago to come to Chicago, do an interview with him at the Virgin Hotels and really connect with a guy like that. I was like, damn, bro, like, I can do this. Probably the biggest, the biggest milestone for me where I was like taking the step to, let's just call it a blue check mark, uh, was hook and sling. And this is when my day job really came into play, right? I'm calling Hook and Sling, all right, on his fucking cell phone. And I'm nervous as shit. And I'm like, I gotta fucking interview Hook and Sling over the phone for 30 minutes max right now. I can't stop, you know, I'm just like, all right, relax. As soon as he picks up the phone, I feel like I'm making a cold call to a customer who's gonna change my life. Everything connected for me. It was one of the best interviews I ever had because the pace was there, but I had a connection with this guy and he was so much fun to talk to and he was so humble for all the success he's had. And I was like, okay, if I can talk to Hook and Sling, I can go 10 steps up. These are just normal people, right? These are people that share the same passion of music with me. And that was really special for me. So that was episode 70, I believe. Um, Steve Gerard was 79, King Arthur was low 90s, I think 91 or 92. I wanna give a shout out to Gianni Blue as well. Um, fucking love that guy such an inspiration such a hard worker um and really episodes i would say uh 65 through 98 99 99 like really fucking awesome people not that everybody else wasn't but this was me like okay here's like step 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 and i realized by like episode 90 right like Friend of mine, RJ Pickens, shout out to RJ Pickens. That was another great interview too. Um, just a Chicago OG, right? Like this guy fucking knows what's up. He's been in the game. And he told me, he was like, sure. I'm like, do you realize what you're doing? You're developing this network here of people that may not know each other, but they know you and they've talked to you. And that gives them a connection. And that's what it's all about. And I was like, God damn it, RJ. God. <laughs> I love that guy. He's so awesome. And again, he was kind of a Steve Girard to me where I was like, I don't, why would that guy ever want to talk to me? Right? But we, we clicked. And it was so dope uh, to hear him say that because it's one thing to think or hear it from like a Tony or my dad or my girlfriend or my roommate to be like, the podcast is great. You're connecting people, right? To have someone come on the show who was on it months before. We reconnect a few times and then him tell me that. I was like, okay, yeah, you're right, man, you're right. And over the past six months, um, some incredible opportunities came my way. I played on a, a huge yacht in New York. Um, I played at the Concord Music Hall. I opened up for Shiba San and Walker and Royce. Uh, I opened up for Gorgon City at Concord. Um, I played at Prism with Vice Tone, Spy Bar twice, and this is like, it, it like all started happening. I was like, I'm not in control of this fucking thing anymore. I felt like a truck in Colorado with the big hills, and I was driving, and I was like, I'm not sure when I'm going to go up this hill because I'm going too fast, and I can't pump the brakes, but I loved it, and I am loving it, but it's a crazy, crazy journey, and I'm still driving a fucking overweight truck going down the longest hill of all time. But I know at the bottom, wherever that is, and even if it never comes, I'm having fun fucking speeding on the highway with my friends in the passenger seat and everybody in the truck. This shit's overweight. But it's uh, it's just wild to be sitting here right now 
on the hundredth episode telling my own story and there's nobody else to thank but the people that have supported me from episode 001 I'm never gonna stop I love doing this it is my true passion and finally now I feel like I'm starting to make a difference and that's what's most important to me I want to give back I want to leave my mark on Chicago on the world on the music industry and that's what's important to me so that's my journey that's where we're at now it's uh late february mid-february i don't know i don't know what days of the week it is usually because it's something every day but here we are so good question sure okay sure so i got a lot of questions here you know how this podcast goes right it's your podcast so you always ask too many fucking questions but we're gonna start with number one my man hey you ready all right here we go okay first question what's your number one goal in 2020 tell us man my number one goal in 2020, um, man, good question. So I definitely made a lot of New Year's resolutions this year. Um, my biggest goal is to have a YouTube presence, uh, without a doubt. YouTube is the number one most consumed social media um, by far. And I know that is where my audience is, right? It's one thing to listen to a podcast, but without seeing who these people are, Unless it's a beautiful audiobook or serial or something like that podcast, you know, you're never going to really have that genuine connection. And podcasts, from a psychological standpoint, make you kind of feel like you're in the conversation, right? When you listen in the car, when you listen on your headphones. Um, but you really have that connection. Like, I probably wouldn't love Joe Rogan as much if I didn't know what he looked like and his facial expressions and the people he interviews, right? Like, sometimes if I'm listening to an episode, I'm like, I got to watch this shit. And that's kind of my goal for this year is build that up, figure out how to leverage YouTube uh, from a profitability standpoint as well. That's a huge goal for me. Um, trying to get multiple streams of revenue coming from the podcast, information that I'm giving, bonus material, behind the scenes, all that sort of stuff. So YouTube is the number one goal for me. I want to be at 1,000 subscribers. I want to be at at least 5,000 hits, um, 5,000 plays per, per episode. So that's definitely the number one thing. Okay, Shunram, I can see you staring at my chest and at my shirt. Yes, I get it. It's a little bit off, you know, but this is Miami, man, okay? Huh? Get with it, all right? We only had Rice Krispies when I was growing up, huh? Frosted Flakes, you ever heard? I didn't think so, huh? You're from Chicago. Whatever. I don't want to get upset at you. That's your show, you know? Hey, but here we go. Another question. You ready? Okay. Who is your career idol? Tell us. My career idol or idols? Um, a lot, a lot for sure. Uh, in regards to my career as a podcaster, as someone in the music industry, um, I look up to a lot of different people because... I believe that I don't want to follow the same path as someone else. There's a saying that I've talked about a lot of times, nothing is original, and this is something that I believe wholeheartedly. And that's, you got to learn from other people's unique works of art, but nothing starts from nothing, right? So there are a few podcasters that I love, Joe Rogan and uh, Lewis Howes. And I want to sort of build a bridge between them. Joe Rogan, kind of the, the raw bullshit of life, but still factoids. Um, great stories, a real comfortable environment. Lewis Howes is amazing at um, just getting people to open up. And that doesn't have to be talking about you know some deep shit you've gone through. That's amazing if you want to share that. But I think it's so important to really make someone else feel comfortable so that they can really, really portray who they are without trying to feel like this is an interview, right? This is a conversation. And I think that's what Lewis Howes and Joe Rogan do really, really well is inspire their guest to tell it all in a genuine way. Almost like you're on your deathbed and this is my no regrets moment. This is what I want to do with still the opportunity to continue living. So I would definitely say Joe Rogan and Lewis Howes from a podcasting standpoint, from a musical standpoint, production and DJ, you know, the list goes on and on, but some huge names that come up to me uh, has got to be Lee Foss. His, his imprint in the Chicago market is fucking wild. And he is such a good DJ producer, label head, personality, 
and uh, I have so much respect for him. I love seeing him DJ as well. I love his productions and his label, Repopulate Mars. Um, also, I would say probably MK. Um, he has just got a template for success, but he's always pushing the boundaries. He's a great live DJ from Detroit, wears his heart on his sleeve, such a stud. Um, and then also from an international standpoint, I love Loco Dice. I just feel like that's the coolest motherfucker walking the earth. <laughs> he is just so fucking cool. Um, and his sets are awesome. His music is great. He is just another guy who has paved the way um, for people to have a career in house and techno. And uh, yeah, he's a huge inspiration for me as well. Okay. This is a good one. This is one that I want to ask you personally. Okay, here we go. What has been the most fun part of the podcast journey so far? Tell us, man. Oh my gosh. Damn, I'm fucking laughing the entire time with these people. It's so, so incredible to be able to sit down with people who usually can't portray their personality in the club or the bar or wherever it is, right? Because a lot of these people are DJs and that's kind of how we know who each other are. Um, there are just so many fun interviews that I've had. Cafe Disco was a really funny interview. Uh, I knew they were funny guys, but we were like laughing the whole time. That was great. Also, another duo, ADLX, uh, was a great time. So the most fun part has been the fun I have with them. Talking about these stories, talking about these these times where you know shit's gone wrong or shit went randomly right, and having my own experiences with that. Just this like. Stories that, although they maybe are on different levels or different lanes, we share this like intuition about each other that, hey, like, I kind of, I feel your energy about this and it's crazy because that's happened to me in one way or another. So the most fun part has definitely been the genuine connections I've been able to develop with people. Now, sure, we're gonna cut a little deep, okay? You know, like when I cut the meat and it's just perfect, but we're going a little deeper with you right now, okay? Huh? Have you thought about quitting? If so, can you recall a specific time and why? Tell us, man. Uh, definitely, I've definitely thought about quitting. Um, it's been a long time since I've really seriously considered that thought. You know, the first, let's say, the first uh, year I was doing an episode every two weeks or so. So, you know, 52 weeks in a year. So I was maybe 20, 25 episodes in, right? And... You know, I was doing well, but like, I guess I kind of had this expectation whether it was too low or too high, and I was not falling anywhere even lower or higher. I was like in some no man's land in between. I don't remember sitting down a specific instance, but um, I definitely remember being like, you know, I'm 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 hitting a point where I don't know how to continue growing. I don't know how to continue getting better gigs. I feel like there's people who are better than me at this. Um, I was really, I've always been focused on my job. Um, I was doing well at my job and I was like, you know, this is a career in my hand. I'm good at this. I like where I work and this is a solid plan. Um, so I would say probably 2017, I was seriously considering stopping everything because you know, when you do anything for the first time and the first couple times, everyone's excited about that and it's really inspiring to continue to get that energy from people, but that doesn't last forever, right? Everybody's got their own things to worry about and it comes to a point where you're by yourself in a dark room, so to speak, and that was happening pretty consistently for me, but like I said earlier, um, those little wins kept me going, so I would say probably 2017 is when I had some low points, but um, it's been a long time since then. Sure, this question uh, comes from a place of true love, right? What do you do it for? The question is, if you took views and listening stats out of podcasting, huh, would you still do it? If there was no plays, no hearts, no nothing, would you still do it, man? Tell us. If I took views and stats out of podcasts, YouTube plays, SoundCloud hearts, Spotify follows, iTunes subscribers, I think it would be tough to know if you're making an influence. Not that data and analytics are necessarily a signal or sign that you are making a difference, but it is nice to monitor growth in a business. And this is a business to me. So I'm always trying to look at the background information, looking at 
geographic markets where someone really liked this episode, someone really liked that episode. How can I continue to target them? What do I do maybe on the ground level from a grassroots marketing perspective? Um, I would still be doing it because this is a release for me. It's a great way for me to disconnect from everything else in life and, and talk about what's most passionate to me um, and most passionate to the person that I'm talking to. So I would still do it, but it'd be really, really hard to know um, if I am growing, but I would still do it, yeah. Okay, man, this is a good one. It comes from a place of true love, huh? Branding, right? Oh, look at this. Huh? I'm wearing a brand, Kellogg's, huh? Rice Krispies, I tell you again, I tell you. Huh? What's the overall Sherm brand plan? Tell us, man, we want to know. Tell us. Mm. The overall Sherm brand plan. Um, ask Tony. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony calls it a project omnipresence, and uh, what that means is just a, a universal knowledge of Sherm. So, my DJ name is Sherm. The podcast is called Sherm in the Booth, right? So, there's a lot of different things that I can do with that. I do love production as well. That's a huge passion of mine. Um, it's not my core focus, but it's definitely an awesome outlet for me to express myself creatively. But the idea that I want to really take it globally is a few different things. Um, something that I just launched this new panel series, Verified, um, which features conversations with leaders from the music industry. There's different types of music and different types of people from all over the world that love music in different ways and look at it in different ways. So. I want to take the panel worldwide. I want to start in Chicago. I want to go to Dallas. I want to go to Nashville. I want to go to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, Boston, right? And then I want to look at South Africa. And then I want to look at fucking Cairo, Egypt. And then I want to look at Madrid, Spain, Kiev, Ukraine, like wherever in Europe, right? Australia. Um, I want to be the one who exposes the behind the scenes look at music because it's not as accessible for people. There's certainly a lot of DJs and producers and folks in the music industry. I think Masterclass is something that does an awesome job of highlighting the expert's take on getting to a point. Um, it's super unique. If you don't look at Masterclass, know about it, definitely check that out. So I wanna do an in-person Masterclass where I give these people from these industries um, really a chance to talk about what they do. The last one went really, really well. We did event curation with John Curley of Paradigm Events, John Cote of uh, John Cote Events. He also co-founded Akira and Clayton De La Chapelle of the Music Trust. These are three people with different views and different experiences, all under the same event curation umbrella, right? So they were able to talk about their experiences, their successes, their failures, what worked, what didn't, and hopefully the more it grows and the more people that watch those things, it can kind of just start to make a global influence. I don't know how long that will take. I don't know if it will work, but the feedback so far has been awesome. I really enjoyed it, the guests really enjoyed it, the people that came really enjoyed it, and as long as I can make a difference to the people in the room where it happened, then I think I'm doing my job. So the idea with the Sherm brand, even though it's not directly verified, you know, I would be hosting the panel, kind of goes hand in hand. Another thing that's a real big passion of mine, like the podcast, is giving people a platform, whether that be to share their story or whether that be to um, play their music, right? So branded stages at festivals would be a huge goal. People that have been on the podcast before, I think that would be so dope. Something that I did um, was the Sherman the Booth Showcase, right? So I hosted an event. Um, with people who have been on the podcast before and they got to play their music. It was five or six different types of DJs. Um, that was really cool. And, um, you know, if we could continue to do things like that on a bigger scale across the United States and again all over the world, that would be awesome. Um, so that's the plan, yeah. Okay, Sherm, you know, we all do things outside of our jobs, right? Like I like to smoke a cigar after I, you know, do my things during the day. I won't tell you about them, but that's another time, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta stop. Aside from the podcast, work and DJing, wicka wicka, you're also managing artists. Huh? That's pretty cool, man. What was your drive to get into that side of the business? That side, man, the artist management. Tell us, man. So, 
yeah, aside from uh, the podcast, music, the Sherm brand, my day job, everything else, um, I also manage some artists with Tony, and it's under the Lavender Group, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in, in regards to how it came about, but um, we're managing artists, and I always say these guys to me are like LeBron James in middle school, right? Like we're scouting these guys, and I'm like, yo, this, these kids are really fucking talented, but they need some help with branding, ball dribbling skills, you know, they need to help, they need help like getting to St. Mary, right? Like whether that be like production tips or collaboration opportunity that I can give them that. Um, and then we got to get these motherfuckers to the NBA and they got to win a finals MVP, right? So it's getting them to Coachella. It's getting them to, yeah, AD, all those types of things. My biggest passion in life is helping others, not to like, help myself necessarily. And I think that's kind of a, a misconstrued idea about people who give, right? It's like, I genuinely love that shit because they are so thankful and I'm gonna name them all out right now. It's it's Naughty Christian Adiella, Justin Sansis, Sansis, uh, Solez Dean Miranda, Solez Dean Flanino, uh, Flynn Patrick Collins, and um, newly Maximo Quinones, um, and myself. These guys are fucking LeBron James in middle school, man. Um, some of them a little bit differently, but um, I believe in them and they believe in their brands and their music and what they're doing is special. So it's gonna take a lot of work and it's gonna be a long timeline and it's gonna be different timelines for all of them. But I know they come from a place of true passion for music and that's what's important to me. So if I've got guys that make really good music and they have a vision, then let me do the bullshit, you know, all those things that I was talking about, and then they just focus on their craft and everything will come together. So we started managing artists probably a year ago or so, maybe a little less. And uh, it's going great so far. It's so much fun to build brands. It's so much fun to hear these guys' music, get feedback. Uh, it's it's incredible, and it's going to be a really big year for a lot of them and beyond. So shout out to all the guys. Okay, sure. Another great question, huh? It's more about your life, man. We want to know what's the other side of Sherman behind the booth, out of the booth, whatever you want to say, huh? What are a couple of your favorite things to do when not working towards career goals? You know, I like to eat the pork, huh? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I I do have some free time, contrary to popular belief. Um, I have uh, an amazing girlfriend. She's been in my life for a long time. Her name's Maya. Um, I love spending time with her. She's a great, great person. She's so smart. She's way smarter than me. Um, but she's such a genuine and kind person. And uh, she loves me for who I am. She loved me when I didn't have a beard, when I was a little chubby, when I got in trouble in high school, when I was a dumb fuck in college. And uh, to have someone support you um, from the beginning is, is so special and inspiring. So I love spending time with her. Um, Chicago's got some incredible restaurants, so we love going out to restaurants. Uh, I gotta give a shout out to Doc B's. That place is the shit. The filet sandwich. Oh, fuck, I want it right now. Um, love going out to restaurants. I certainly love going to shows. Uh, all the venues here, I've, they've, they've all come up on the podcast. I have DJs on from every single venue, and it's so amazing how they all speak so highly of them because I'm on the same page as them, right? And it's great for people to see what it's really like because you have this negative connotation sometimes of clubs if you don't know about the club life, off the underground scene as well. Um, so that's great. Love going out to events, of course. Um, like I said, I, I did a lot of, uh, of uh, film studies and projects in college so i love movies um i am more of an indie type guy i like will fuck around with the avengers of course i think thor is the best come at me if you don't but um i love that shit uh also really love photography uh that's a big passion i don't share a lot of my photos but um they're more for personal use um just for reminiscing on old times, like I said, time hop earlier. So I just love documenting everything. I think there's no reason not to take advantage of the technology we have to look back on when we're older. So that's a big thing for me as well. Um, I also love sports. Um, I grew up playing lacrosse, 
Um, still watch a lot of that. My brother was a very successful athlete. He went to DePaul. He uh, was an incredible lacrosse player, and uh, we, we always connected on that. My mom was a great lacrosse coach, too. She won uh, two state championships at IU. She started the women's program in Indiana. Uh, my dad was always at every single game. Um, incredible guy. So we all really connect around sports. That was a big thing for me. Indiana sports, too. The Pacers, uh, the Colts. Uh, it's tough being a fan of both those teams. But uh, we do our best. I always, always love watching the IU Hoosiers as well, too. So those are a lot of big releases for me. All right, Sherm, you do a lot of cool stuff in the city, huh? You must know some gems, eh? Some gems, you know what I mean, man? What are a few hot spots in Chicago people should be hitting up? Restaurants, parties, tell us, man, tell us. All right, some hot spots in Chicago. You hear that? I didn't used to say Chicago like that. Now I really do. You fucking Chicago DJs make me say Chicago. Um... There are a lot of awesome spots in Chicago. Definitely Doc B's, some other good bars. Money Gun is a really sick place, too. I would r definitely recommend you go. It's an awesome kind of hidden bar. Uh, Three Dots and a Dash has gotten a little bit commercialized, unfortunately, but that's a great place. Um, super fun. Um, I mean, there are so many great places in the West Loop. All the, the, the goats are awesome. Duck Duck Goat is a great experience. Um, those are those are super special dining experience too like you gotta go uh let's see here go up a little more north like in wrigley if you haven't fucking hit balls in the slugger's cage then just move out of chicago um but that is so much fun up there wrigley is like another fucking world and it's always crazy to go up there and be like here we're going to wrigley tonight you know i gotta drink fucking seltzer and shots of tequila but I think that's what makes Chicago so special is all the neighborhoods. I mean, you go over to the West Loop, you go to the Loop, you go to River North, you go to Old Town, you go to Gold Coast. It's just like so amazing because everything's close but far. Um, so just this, the neighborhoods are, are incredible. Chinatown, if you haven't been over there, you got to go down to 22nd Street. I can't remember the name of the place. Um, God damn it, what's the name of the place? They're all good. Lo go to any. Lo Sheshuan? <laughs> Lo Shishuan. I don't. I'm not saying that right. Uh, Chinatown's awesome, so definitely check that out too. Uh, let's see if I can come up with a really, really VIP place. I don't even want to. I almost don't want to give you a VIP place because that's like that's my spot. But the roof on the wit, I think, is very underrated. It's probably top three favorite places for me to DJ. They just renovated it. Um, it's a super, super dope um, room see-through glass amazing led tvs um great sound system incredible cocktails it's uh, uh one of the best rooftop venues in chicago so that's probably top three favorite places in chicago for me but i would definitely recommend you guys go to doc b's okay next up good question here huh because that's where i'm from a desert island motherfucker okay you ever been to cuba probably not huh you're stranded on an island with an iPod Nano, that's all we have there. <laughs> an iPod Nano? Nanos, right? Fuck them. What are some of your top tracks on there? I'll give you 16 gigabytes. That's it. That's it. 16 gigabytes. What is on your iPod Nano on the island? Shrimp, tell us, man. We want to know. Astro World, the whole album. Travis Scott. Um, I feel like I'm taking up all 16 gigs, but. <laughs> Let me get, oof, Ugh, this is tough, god damn. I'll be okay with Asher Road, I just wanna get that out there. Um, gotta give me one house track. I'm gonna take, play Jax Jones Purple Disco Machine Remix. Yeah. Okay, we'll go a little bit more old school. Radiohead, I'll just do like a few tracks because there's so much variety. Idiotech, 15 step, everything in its right place. I'll take those three tracks. Um, <sighs> call me douchey. I'm going to take Dave Matthews, number 41. Shout out to my boy, Exonic. We connected on that. He's the fucking man. Love, love me some Dave Matthews, man. Fuck it, dude. I had some great times in high school. I grew up in Indiana. Um, I don't really care what you think. I think it's good. Uh, I would also say... 
gotta give me gotta give me cold play um i'm sounding so cookie cutter right now <laughs> uh cold play oof him for the weekend is, is a really really powerful song um viva la vida yeah i gotta be out of room on this nano now Whew, okay Okay, Sherm, this is another good one. I love this question. I spent so long coming up with the right, but it's a classic one. If you could have dinner with three famous people alive or deceased, dead, dead man, you can bring them back for dinner, whatever you want. Who would they be and why? Tell us, man, we want to know. Okay, three famous people alive or deceased. Since this is my 100th episode, I'm gonna do three dead, one dinner. We're gonna do lunch with the dead people, dinner with the alive people, because we're going out after. Lunch. Um, Jimi Hendrix. I was a huge fan of him growing up. Uh, he, he's just, all along the Watchtower is such a fucking dope song, right? And this guy's just an icon, and he's just like a rock star to me. He is a rock star to everybody, but he was huge. I'd go with Jimi Hendrix, um, John Lennon. Uh, I just watched that movie yesterday. If you guys haven't seen that, you definitely should. It's really, really cool. You forget about how big of an impact the Beatles made on the entire world. So it's more than the music with John Lennon to me. I would say it's his view on what music is and the impact it makes. So me, Jimmy, and John. <sighs> Damn, bro. Probably Bob Marley. Probably Bob Marley. We're going to have a good old time. Uh, I just think conversation with those guys, I could tell them about techno. <laughs> they would not like it probably, but I'd tell them what's going on in 2020. But that would be a really, really fun lunch. If you have to be on the beach, um, that'd be awesome. Alive. This is going to, we're going to fucking party. We're not even going to eat at this dinner. It's just appetizers. Uh, Jacques Webster, a.k.a. Travis Scott. Yeah, I'm that big of a fan. <laughs> Travis Scott. Um, Elon Musk. And fucking Joe Rogan. We're going to fucking have a great time. We're going to probably... Meet up at Travis's, then we'll take uh, Elon's jet to the Palo Alto Valley. Joe Rogan will obviously be there with, you know, all his team. We'll have a great time. We'll probably do a podcast. We'll be up all night. It'll be a fucking blast. So there's my answers for you. Okay. Now this is a good question, so I'm right. It's about nature. Do, 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 do. You know the birds, the bees, the grasshoppers, whatever you have here in Chicago. Okay. It's nothing compared to Cuba. I tell you that. Huh? Or nurture. Like, oh, I love you, little baby shirt. Would you say? You have innate musical entertainer talent or are they skills you've owned over time? Owned. I'll spell it for you because I can't say H. H. O N E D. Have you owned them over time? Tell us. We want to know. I think everyone's born with something special. Um, I would say a lot of my interpersonal communication skills and willingness to work harder and, and learn um, definitely comes from my parents, right? So I, I believe a lot in life is how you're raised. Um, in fact, I'm not keen to judge anyone because of how they might have been raised. Um, it's neither here nor there, but I believe that things are nurtured. Uh, again, people are born with a gift, um, whatever it might be. Some people never find their gift, um, unfortunately, but some people find it early, some people find it in the middle of life, some people find it late. I'm happy that whether this is my true gift or not, I'm I'm pumped that I'm like excited to do this type of stuff, right? So this is this is what's most important to me is meeting people. Um, there's a there's a a movie producer and director and author that I really like. His name is Brian Grazer. Um, he he is someone who bases a lot of his success off curiosity. He calls these curiosity conversations in this book called The Art of Human Connection Face to Face. And in this book, he talks a lot about focusing on the conversation at hand. And until I really started thinking about it like that, and again, that kind of goes into when I was talking about episodes 60 through 99, 
not that I wasn't like into the conversation, but I was like fucking dialed in, right? I'm really looking at them. I'm really thinking about their story. I'm thinking about what they're saying. I'm listening. I'm not thinking about someone who texted me or looking at my phone. It's all the way over there. Um, so that was nurtured for me and I, I self-nurtured to a certain extent. I wanted to become a better version of myself, the best version, and I still am every single day. But I do believe, final answer, everyone's born with something. You, If you're lucky enough to find it or something close to it, take that and fucking run with it and do everything you can to make sure that it's what you do every day. Um, and if you can make money off it, that's the perfect life. Okay, Sherm, this is a good one, okay? Because Chicago, Midwest, people love each other, love each other, right? Collectives, right? This is no Havana. Shout out to any collectives that you love and respect in Chicago, man. We want to know. That is, <sighs> my God. The amount of collectives that I'm fucking friends with here. First and foremost, good luck, Chicago. Alex Kislov and RV Mala. I get so much fucking love for those guys. They do really, really special events. They have been in the game for a long time. And where they're at now is only due to the fact that they fucking hustled their ass off. So shout out to them. Everybody else involved, too, with Good Look Chicago. It's not just them. Joe Falduto, D-Flow. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, of course, the Be Nice Collective. I mean, fucking Flanino. You got Nick Nice, you got AO, you got Pharaoh, I mean, Placebo, we got Ben Elliott. Like, these guys, like, are differentiators in the scene. And they work harder than a lot of people. I want to give a shout out to Collective Management as well. Uh, Luis, Alex, Juju, all the homies over there, they fucking crush it. They do great events. And I'm humbled to call them my friends as well because they're all really fucking talented guys. Um, Manifest, of course, love them. Um, Zooey Glass, Abigail, they already know. I think what they're doing is 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 so groundbreaking. Honestly, it's it's really really unique. Their perspective on the scene, their perspective on music, how they go about everything, and uh, it's just such pleasure to know people like them. Let's see here. Definitely Paradigm Presents. Um, John Curley and Infinity and Intermodal, everything that they do with Spy Bar and all their events is 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 beyond what is like even imaginable to me sometimes. I mean, the things that these guys put together, I was just watching uh, the panel again with John Curley. This guy dropped Visceral Experience and I like was like almost passed out. I was like, fuck, dude, that's what I feel like. It's like a word that you don't say other than like one time a year at a visceral experience, right? It's sometimes when you don't even realize you know a word and you're in something, you're like, I'm having a visceral experience right now. And I just got so much love and respect for them. Um, there's certainly a lot of collectives as well, but um, you know the list could go on and on. Those guys are definitely, in my opinion, making the biggest strides and pushing the scene forward. Okay, Sherm, so you know I want to know, but the people want to know. A little more about you. They ask you specific questions. Okay, these are from Instagram, right? We asked, what do you want to know about Shern? Huh? First up, Party with Nardi wants to know, how has podcasting helped you grow? How? Tell us. Party with Nardi, my fucking guy, Boosted Stripes. That was an awesome interview as well. Shout out to Chris. Shout out to Evan. Um, how has podcasting helped me grow? so many different ways personal responsibility accountability i always pretend like there's a, a label or someone behind me saying is this going to be on time or is this going to be good um, so it's definitely helped me um, a lot with managing expectations with myself so definitely that helped me grow from a personal standpoint as well um, just understanding what it's like to look through the eyes of other people um, in different types of upbringings, influences, uh, just mentalities. So just really, really actually getting the chance to understand what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. Um, so that's really cool. It's also helped me grow, um, you know, from an actual like growth standpoint, my brand, my plays, my support, to have the podcast be at 100 episodes now means that all that more 
or all all those more people have listened and followed and messaged me and asked me questions and you know I'm I'm taking probably probably a, a call or two a week from people who just want to learn how to get into the Chicago industry who want to learn more about podcasting the lavender group so many different things so um, being able to grow to a point where other people are now asking me for advice is really really special too so lots of different ways good question Chris okay another question from party with naughty this guy obviously parties because he's asking two questions nobody likes one on one but he's been drinking huh? you know what I mean okay if you had to pick one podcast that went completely different than what you expected which one and you already know oh I... another good one Chris god damn it um man there were a lot that i went in you know you never want to have any expectations sort of of anybody and a lot of people i'm meeting for the first time um bringing them into my home having a genuine conversation with them and um not knowing what to expect expect and they probably think the same thing um some really special ones that uh went down a a different path um a really great one was luca um, we got really, really deep into self, self enlightenment and how to be the best version of yourself and holding yourself accountable. Like I just said, time management, and all that sort of stuff. Luca is is an extremely creative person, but he is extremely motivated um, in the sense that he believes so much in himself. Himself. He also has a lot of different crazy passions that I didn't know about. He's really into motorcycles. Um, he had some crazy stories that I didn't know anything about as well. So that one not necessarily took a turn, but I didn't expect it to go that way. And probably a personal favorite of mine, I did a FaceTime with Win and Wu, right? These guys are fucking out in LA and I'm in my room and I'm like, here we go. This is Win and Wu. Like I've been listening to these guys for so long. Man, they're just, they're just two guys who love fucking IPAs from the Midwest and we connected and it was such a special conversation. I have so much respect for them, and they have been one of the duos, one of the groups that have made it really, really tangible. Um, it's not like seeing Calvin Harris play at Stereo Sonic and go, I'm never going to get there. How do you do that, right? To see Win and Woo grow through the SoundCloud era and still rise above um, to an originality standpoint, right? And then to play at Lollapalooza, um, just from another Chicago out of Chicago group. I was like, that's big. And they were, even though so humble about it, they were pretty like, yeah, it was fucking dope. So that was really cool. And it was awesome to connect with them. I don't think either of us knew what we were going to get out of that conversation. But by the end of it, um, it was really special. Okay, man, real quick, I got to take a sip, huh? Mm. Better yet, huh? Little French, little Havana. Oh, perfect, man. Let me get back into it, though. Sorry. At Tim Celebrity, mm, like that name, would you travel out of state for an interview? Tell us, man, we want to know. Tim Celebrity, my fucking guy. I want to give a shout out to this guy. He makes all the posters for the Lavender Group. He's been on the podcast. He runs Wealthy Habits. Um, he is just such a great guy to hang out with. So much fun. Uh, Tim, I definitely would go out of state for a podcast. Um, like I was talking about earlier, um, I want to glow, grow the global presence, right? And it's one thing to have a conversation with someone over the phone. It's another thing to go to where they're at. And that's why I like doing a lot of interviews at people's studios in their home where they fe feel comfortable. Um, so I'd be so down to go to wherever. I'm going to Miami Music Week in a month and I'm bringing all my podcast equipment. We're lining up a few there. So, you know, if you want to count that, it's going to be a big collective of people. So... Um, more than more than willing to go to other states and of course all over the world as well. That's definitely a dream. Good question, Tim. All right, next up we got Ed J. Willie. How do you personally know when a track is done and ready for release, man? When do the people get it? Tell us. J. Willie. Good question. You know a track is done in a banger. Man, it's different for every track. Um, it goes through so many different levels of, oh, this idea is a great, I just finished this today, I'm going to play it at club tonight, let me throw a quick master on this and see how it sounds. 
sometimes you have a track that you rotate for a year maybe you never release it i have a few that i've been playing that i'm not really sure when i want to does it fit where i'm currently at musically um do i want to go back and make some changes but one of the common themes that i've learned and also from other people who are really talented producers is it's it's not the best idea to hold on to something you need to be done with it right so probably the best steps for that are to get feedback from three or four people that you really trust and will give you the hard facts, right? Um, a good friend of mine, Brian Gorecki, one of the birthday party guys, he's an incredible producer, right? Him and his brother, John, great, great producers. And they're some of the most honest guys I know. And I remember sending a track to Brian, Brian giving me like three paragraphs. And I thought this track was done. <laughs> he's like, yeah, this is good. But da, 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 da. And I'm like, oh, damn it. So always get another ear on it. It's gonna be case by case, but you know it really when you play it at a place where it's the right space, right? So I don't wanna drop a techno track at a bar. If it's the right feel, then you're like, okay, this is ready. So that's when you know. Okay, Shunner, this one's from The Most Wanted. Okay, I've been wanted before too. I know what it's like, so I get this question, man. Get it, huh? Batman or Superman? Tell us. Which one? Batman? Superman? Who are you? The most wanted. Dude, this is Chicago, man. I'm fucking Batman, bro. You know, when I take people uh, who come to visit me, I always take them on a city tour. I have a little guidebook of uh, movie scenes, right? And I always make the same damn joke. My girlfriend hates it. We're ever in an Uber on Lower Wacker. They're, I'm like, do you know the Lower Wacker route? And they're like, no. And I'm like, we're taking Lower Wacker, right? And Ubers never want to take fucking Lower Wacker because they're like, I'm going to get lost, right? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just fucking learn how to drive. We take it, and I'm like, so how's it going so far? Every single time. They're like, oh, it's good. You know you know your way around here. That's great. I'm like, yeah, do you feel a little bit of a creepy vibe? This is where Batman was filmed. <laughs> and they're always like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You're talking about the scene with the truck where they flip it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, definitely Batman. Uh, he's just more of a realistic superhero to me. If he's even really a superhero, but for sure, Batman. Okay, Sean, we almost getting there, but we're not done yet, man. We want to know a few more things, okay? So this one comes from at Dina Marciano Design. Ooh, I love that name, Marciano. Which of your five senses would you say is your strongest? I'm going to tell you right now, it's my nose. I smell that pastor coming around the corner and I say, oh, chihuahua. So you tell us, man. Which one of your senses is the strongest in way? Dina Marciano Design. Um, first off, great question. Thank you for asking. Which one of my five senses? <sighs> um, oh, man. Fuck. Good question. Good question. Um, I, would, I would say hearing. I take really, really good care of my ears. I always wear earplugs because um, I've always had a, a keen sense of hearing, I'd like to think. Um, and more than the average person, I need to be able to hear well when it comes to gigs, when it comes to uh, working on music, when it comes to listening to people, talking on the phone, my day job, all that sort of stuff. So um, it's the most important to me. And I would say because of that is the reason it's my best. All right, Sean, we got a few more. You ready? Okay, I am. This one comes from my guy. His name's at Ben Happ. You know this guy? You know this guy? Okay. He wants to know what do you think of your middle name? Middle in between the first and the last. What do you think of it, man? Ben Hap. This guy is uh, my brother. His name's Ben Sherman. Well, jackass. Uh, your middle name is in your tag, Hap. He's named after our, um, our great-grandfather, whose middle name was Happy. So I don't know who's cooler here. My middle name is Ian. Uh, not a lot of people know that. I never say that. I don't know if it really even fits my personality. Now that I'm talking about it, I think I know why he asked it. I don't know if I like it. <laughs> so thanks, mom and dad. But yeah, my middle name is Ian. Okay, Sherm, here we go. This is a good one. I like this one. I wish I could answer, but it's not my show. You know what I mean? Okay, this one. At Boogan Villa Music. If you were ever famous, what would it be famous for? Wow, well, Boogan Villa Music. Um, I can't believe you asked me a question. I love you guys. Great producers. Um, that's wild. Uh, if I ever became famous for something, if it wasn't music, let's just say that, man, I love cooking. Uh, shout out HelloFresh. 
I'd love to be sponsored by you guys. Um, I would say I'd love to be famous for culinary arts. Uh, I love cooking for people. It's so much fun to make everything from, you know, from the beginning to the end, the presentation. Shit, I even like cleaning up now. It's fucking weird. I feel like I really earned it. Um, but I would say probably cooking. That'd be awesome. Okay, this one comes from a guy named Ad Flinino. Flinino. God, that rolls out the tongue. And I can't even get a roll. It rolls so well. Will Sherm ever get out of the booth? That is my we want to know. At Flanino, will I ever get out of the booth? Good question, man. I don't know. You've tried to pull me out a few times. For those that don't know, obviously, Sherm in the booth means that we're in multiple booths. If you haven't connected already, Sherm in, Sherm in, kind of fits, right? Yeah. Um, I will never get out of the booth. I'm never going to get out of the booth. That's my answer, Flynn. At the Music Trust, Sherm wants to know about you. What type of beard oil do you use? I want to know this as well. Tell us, what type of beard oil? The Music Trust asked me what type of beard oil I use. Okay. All right, Clay. Uh, <laughs> I actually don't use too much beard oil. Um, in fact, when I do use it, I don't really know the brand. I am lucky enough to have had the same barber for four and a half years now. His name's Jose Luis. He works in the barbershop. Connected to my building, I walk down to that motherfucker in my slippers and I get a glass of whiskey and he just takes care of business. So you're gonna have to ask him, I guess. But he does do a great job, that's for sure. Shout out Jose Luis. Okay, sure, just a few more, but I love this one too, huh? This one from at Chinese Boy says, what goes on in your mind before the show, huh? Tell us, man, we want to know. Chinese Boy, shout out to Ray. Uh, he has been a huge supporter of me for a long time, so a lot of love to that guy. Um, what goes on my mind before a set? It depends, you know, if it's an open format set, um, if it's an extended one, let's just say it's four or five hours and I'm gonna play a bunch of different types of music. Um, I do always like to get mentally focused. I like to come in prepared. I'm a USB DJ, so I don't use a laptop. I always make sure the playlists for that night are gonna be organized. Um, so from a mental, mental standpoint, I make sure I'm prepared. Let's say it's something bigger if it's maybe, um, you know, let's use Shiba San and Walker Noise at Concord. Uh, mentally, I prepare that one I found out uh, a little bit before, so, or I'm sorry, shortly before, so I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. But luckily how I organize my music, shout out to Danger Wayne, who um, I just interviewed recently, but he had given me advice previously and it's how you organize it. And it's the feeling in a room. So if you have a house set that you're gonna play, there's multiple different energy levels, right? So it's low energy, deep house, mid tempo, a little bit quicker, a little more vocals, and then techno and type stuff, right? So I have my playlist organized and I like to always look through how I always have to, I like to know what song I'm gonna start with, if it's a bigger set. Um, it just, it's really gonna set my mindset off for which direction I'm gonna go. So with that one, I knew that since it's Shiba San and Walker and Royce, a lot more house, tech house, dark type stuff. I started off pretty left field, so to speak, in regards to the house house, house field. Um, but for something like Galantis that I'm playing in a few weeks, I have two sets. So I'm looking at it like, okay, here's a good way for me to showcase my style. Friday is gonna be a little more disco, new disco, upbeat house Saturday. I'm not gonna tell anybody yet, it's gonna be fun. But I do definitely mentally prepare, right? Great question. All right, Shun. Here we go, I like this one too. At Alec Jenberg says, how do you balance a job, hmm? DJing, podcasting, and more with the ability to still get up early? Man, you impressed me with this question. Tell us, cause we want to know. Alex Shenberg. Um, massive shout out to that guy as well. He's been uh, my go-to videographer and photographer for my own brand, for Lavender Group. He is a super hard worker, so he should be asking himself this question. Um, he works really, really hard too. But Alex, how I do it is, man, I just, I just make sure to pace myself. Um, it's really, really important that if you do feel overwhelmed, if you feel like you're taking on a lot, appreciate that right like you're doing a lot you're not going to be able to keep working at that level 
for a long period of time, right? So I take little breaks. Uh, something that I really think about is focus. There's a great there's a great quote, an idea that I know, that's about if you hold a piece of paper up to the sun, it's gonna find a point on that piece of paper and it's gonna be so focused in that it's gonna burn a hole through that, right? So I don't wanna be trying to burn multiple hose if, holes. If my, multiple holes, <laughs> if my paper is my life, I'm picking one piece at a time, right? So I put all my effort and focus and energy and not that I'm Elon Musk, but this is what Elon Musk does. He really hones into one thing at a time. So if I am working on my podcast, that's what I'm doing, phones away. If I'm at my job, my day job, that's what I'm doing. Um, if I'm gonna be spending my own personal time, let's say it's cooking or working out, that's what I'm doing. Um, I really try and just spread things out as best I can. I also am lucky enough with my day job that I don't have to DJ every weekend. So I will try and get probably one weekend off a month um, just to like hang out, I mean, work out, whatever, just relax, reset mentally. Um, er, getting up early, uh, you just get in that rhythm, man. I mean, my job starts at 7 a.m., so I've been getting up at 6 a.m. for five years now. So it's just kind of a part of me, right? I can't even sleep out on the weekends anymore. It sucks. But I feel like I do have a leg up uh, on everybody else when I get up early. A lot of people are at work at 9 a.m. I've already been there for two hours. I already got a lot of stuff done. So it's just kind of a, another sense of accomplishment. But awesome question. You're the fucking man, Alex. All right, Sean. This one, not a good one, huh? At DJ Fado. You know, like the Fado? Fado. Egypt, man. It's good. It's good. It's a good name. Where did your love for house music come from? Where? Where, where, where did it come from? That is. Pharaoh. Be nice collective guy, former. Um, he's such an awesome DJ. Check him out, DJ Farrell. Um, good question, man. My love of house music grew. So I told the story earlier about Dead Mouse, and I was always kind of listening to it, but it's one thing to experience house through headphones or in car speakers, and it's another thing to hear it live on a fucking sound system. So I went to CrossFest with some friends, and I knew a lot of the names, Claptone, MK, some more top level type guys, right? And I went just to have a good time. It was in San Diego. It's on like this beautiful waterfront. And I saw a bunch of DJs that I hadn't seen before. And they were fucking crushing it. And I remember it was the first time I really heard some dope bass lines live. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, how have I never, how have I never heard this? We got back and everybody I was with, shout out Chinese boy Ray. We're just like searching for these big bass lines. I'm like, where are these big bass lines? Like, what is this music? I'm like trying to find these people's t uh, type of style. And that is just when everything fucking flipped. I literally became obsessed with house and DJing it, producing it. It really inspired me on a production level standpoint as well, which was cool. So um, going to CrossFest, I'm trying to remember what the year was. I think it was probably 2017. And it... It, I would almost say it changed my life. So, good question, Pharaoh. It was CrossFest. Okay, so next up, this one comes from a guy named at Isaac Palmer Official. He's official, that's for sure. It's in his name. When is new charm music coming? When? When, 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 when will we get new music? Isaac Palmer, another guy that I mentioned earlier. Isaac, Isaac likes charm music. He's helped me a lot. He actually was one of my first mentors. Uh, we use Logic, so if anyone who uses Logic out there, you know how much of a biatch it can be. Isaac helped me a lot. I use, I have his hot cues imported into mine, actually. Um, new Sure Music is coming, bro. Me and Flynn have a track coming out on True Musica called Worry, March 6th. Um, really excited about that. I've got some tracks that are finished that I was talking about a little bit earlier. One of them is called The Shermanator. I have been dropping it. Um, you know I had to do it. Samples American Pie, and uh, it's a really, really cool track. That's going to be coming out soon as well. And I do have another one that's unreleased as well with Max, Maximo Quinones and Fuenino. Um It's called Ether. We're working on something big for that, but we do have a lot of music coming. I promise you that, Isaac. Okay, here we go. This one guy, he calls himself Dom Dom It. Dom. Jesus, man. Inappropriate, whatever. Good question. I want to know the answer too. Where can we? Okay, he said I. I want we to 
Find the best slice of pizza in Chicago. Where can we get it? Huh? Little Italian, a little deep dish. What do we got? Shrimp tell us, because we want to know. Dom Dan wants to know where you can find the best slice of pizza in Chicago. Dominic, you know this. Well, slice. He said slice, so let's be specific. Dobros. Dobros on state. Okay? That place, thin slice of cheese. Fold it, boom, bang, boom, I'm on my way. If you're really feeling it, and you were at El Jefe or Henry's for a little too late, why don't you go ahead and get a little mushroom truffle, okay? Have a good night. Thank you. <clears throat> Shut up. We got a few more. Let's keep it rolling, huh? This is episode 100. This is a major milestone, and we're going to ask you something deep, man. Deep. Ready? Huh? You ready? Okay. At Alex Kislov says... What is your biggest goal in life? The biggest, the biggest, huh? All the way up here, what's the biggest goal? And tell us, man, cuz we want to know. We want to know, tell us, what's your biggest goal? Alex Kislov, of course, asks the, the deepest question. That fucking guy, I love him. My biggest goal for life, it probably goes back into Project Omnipresence, man. Um, I want to make a significant impact on the world from a cultural standpoint in regards to what goes on behind the scenes in the music industry. I think there's a lot of offensive linemen that people don't know about, whether it be the people who master tracks, the people who work in the you know AV tent at Lollapalooza. Um, and those are the people that are usually, in my experience at least, the most passionate about music. So. Probably my biggest goal in life is to expose and give those people a chance to tell their story. So that would be one of the main things as well. But great question, Alex. Shout out to you, man. All right, Shun. All right, you see me now? I look you in the eyes when I ask you this question because this is what it's all about. This says a lot about your character, huh? When you go into a restaurant, they say, would you like a booth or would you like a high top? What's your answer, huh? Sherm, it's your reservation, man. Tell us. Because I want to know. The hostess wants to know. Your friends certainly want to know. What do you pick, Booth or High Top, man? Mike Bonsole, where you been, homie? <laughs> Shit. Booths or High Tops? <laughs> Clearly not a lot has changed. I fucking love this guy. Dude, I'm a booth guy, man. I got spread out a little bit. I always like to be able to look at everybody if we can get a round table that's going to be a perfect situation more of like a round table booth that would be ideal but i'm a booth guy some guy named tony old boy tony old boy is he old or young is he a boy that's confusing whatever good question though who do you want to do a b2b back to back with in chicago pretty cool question for an old young guy tell us tony old boy who would I want to do a back to back with, back with in Chicago? Let's just say this is a Chicago artist, big or small. Well, I do want to say real quick, I've done a lot of back to back sets with people that I've never gone back to back with. Shout out to Shiny, shout out to uh, uh, Nabs, shout out to Flanino, um, a lot of other people as well. But probably one that I'd still like to do, shout out to Nick Nice too. Um, Dude, I would love to go back to back with Win and Woo. I think that would be really cool because when I interviewed them, it was really funny because Win has a different style when it comes to like individuality and Wu does as well. So that was really funny to hear them kind of not collide or clash, but I would say probably it would be incredible because I have my style and they both two have their own. So that would be really cool. I'd say win and will. Okay, sure. This is a good one. I like it and I'm interested to know. RJ Pickens won. Wants to know. What is your favorite stand-up comedy special? Tell us. Because we want to know. RJ Pickens. Once again. I, we, I connected with this guy on like 50 different things. Mm -hmm. One of them was stand-up comedy. Uh, we gotta go. Okay, we're gonna go, RJ. I'm, I'm not gonna just keep empty, giving you empty promises. My favorite right now, probably, I was crying laughing at Sebastian Maniscalco's most recent one. Like, 
literally like sprawling on the couch like flailing laughing almost elbowed my girlfriend in the eye i was laughing so hard he talks about going into a stranger's house for dinner and then making his take his shoes off i had been in a situation like that before and i didn't get why i had to take my fucking shoes off like and it was weird it's not that i don't get taking my shoes off right but you take your shoes off and they're like waiting for you to take your shoes off. And you're like, look, I'll, I'll come. Like, don't, like, this is weird. You know, I'm wearing boots. And I just related to that. <laughs> it was so funny. So if you haven't seen that, Sebastian Maniscalco on Netflix, the most recent one. Good question, RJ. Okay. All right, Shrimp. Some of the other names have been a little bit easier to say. This one's a little tough on my accent. You're going to hear it right now, okay? At Christian Brew. How do you say? I don't know what to say. Christian Bru wants to know what are your favorite Chicago spots to DJ? Oh, wicka wicka, where? Christian, Chicago misses you, man. A um, lot of great spots to DJ in Chicago. I mentioned Roof on the Wit. Um, that is just a perfect scene for me, kind of open format house, really vocal driven, but I can get deep, I can get a little techie. Um, that's an awesome spot. Spy Bar, of course, has got to be one of the top of the list just to be able to play what you want to play and not have to think is this what the crowd wants the crowd is there to listen to the djs do their thing so i think that's what makes it super unique from a cultural standpoint on a local level and also a very desirable place on an international level they have some of the biggest djs in the world want to come to spy bar specifically so to share the decks with people that have been there is really special but i will say without a shadow of doubt r.i.p to the mid that is the best place um, that i've ever played played there on new year's eve twice and um i played there the last new year's eve and i got through the countdown to uh, midnight and i was i cried right like <laughs> you know like there's a video on my instagram you gotta watch it uh, it was so special, and to be there with all the guys that um, run the mid, shout out to Mike Lang and, and RB as well, they were there, and it was just so crazy, right, to kind of close it down, but definitely the mid, and I know a lot of people agree with me on that. Good question, Krishan. All right, Sean, this is a good one, ready? At Gilded, G-L-D-E-D, -E wants to know, describe the importance and impact of Indianapolis sports teams on your adolescence. I want to know. They want to know. Tell us, man, because we all want to know. Gilded, my man. Um, had this guy on the podcast twice. He's a really good friend of mine. He's incredibly talented. If you guys haven't checked him out, go listen to the podcast. I've got some of his music on there. But he is going to be one of the biggest recording acts um, ever. I'm positive of that. G-L-D-E-D. -E of course he goes deep. He's a highly intellectual and emotional guy, emotional on a emotional intelligence guy. The impact of Indianapolis on my life. Indianapolis sports. <laughs> God damn it, VR. Um, huge, honestly. I think about so many things growing up. Um, one thing in particular, um, that's a funny story actually, the Pacers were playing the Knicks, and this was, um, man, it must have been late 90s. I was so young that I still remember it, but I remember if you guys watch basketball, you might remember this. It was uh, playoffs. This guy named Larry Johnson, I believe, um, hit a three-pointer, and they called a foul, and it put him up, but he didn't get fouled. And he did this, right? Like, he hit me on the arm. And I'm pretty sure it was Reggie Miller who fouled him. Reggie went crazy. It was like Spike Lee versus Reggie. My dad screaming at the television, right? And he's not this type of person. And I start crying. My mom's yelling at my dad. Then I'm crying because my mom's yelling. And then my little brother's like crying because he's like a baby. And I just remember being like, looking back and being like, Jesus, like this is Indiana sports. Like it's so emotional. Uh, when the Colts won the Super Bowl, I remember how excited everyone was. Everyone was. I think it was middle school, and it was just like crazy to really feel that. And I know a lot of their sports teams have won championships and stuff, and that's a common theme. But Indiana sort of has its own—I wouldn't call it an echelon, but a level of love. I mean, to go to Indiana University and see the Indiana Hoosiers be number one in the country with Victor Oladipo and Cody Zeller. 
um, it just made a really, really huge impact on me uh, in regards to what sports can do to a community. So um, a huge impact, I would say, Gilded. Okay, sure. Good question here. At Benjo Harp, to um or for um, do you owe the most gratitude? Great question. Tell us. Who? To whom or for whom? Thank you for phrasing that correctly, Benjo Harp. Um, do I owe the most gratitude? Um, you know, I'm going to give it to... I'm gonna give it to a few people. I'm gonna give it one to the guy who asked me the question, Benjo Harp. This guy um, was so driven at a young age to be a talented musician. He was playing guitar. He was, he's was he been a friend of mine for a long time. We played on the same basketball team in like third or fourth grade or something. And uh, he was a little more shy, right? But he has an incredible voice. And when he sang and when he played guitar, it was so inspiring to see someone who is uh you know well not you know just known for maybe being someone who you have to get to know right rather than someone who's a little more like me extroverted and to see him just like want to be himself fully um from middle school until now has been such an inspiration for me because he's worked so hard um another good mutual friend of ours is this guy named thomas buchanan he is such an incredible piano player he's so musically talented he introduced me to tons of bands the smashing pumpkins fleet foxes like this whole indie side of music right radiohead as well and thomas um was a, a huge driver for me to always be trying to discover new music so from a musical standpoint those two guys were always like hey here's this i think you'll like this and pushing it forward to me so that was big but i have to say probably a tie my parents my mom and dad um, you know, they were raised to work for themselves. My dad was born in Queens, New York. He grew up in Bay, uh, Bayside, Queens. Um, him and his brother were the first college students. His dad, my grandpa, owned a men's clothing store that my dad worked at. I mean, these are fucking New York people, right? Like, my dad says, drawer, like, draw. So, you know, like, this is who they are. And my uncle and cousin and aunt still live in New York. Um, so this kind of East Coast attitude has always been in, in my blood. Work hard and earn it, but be a good person along the way. My mom's from Baltimore, Maryland. Her parents from there as well. My mom paid for herself to go through nursing school. Um, that's actually where my parents met was in Los Angeles. That's where I was born. Um, and they worked for everything they've earned. And even though... Um, they had had success already when I was growing up. I still wasn't really given a lot. I had to earn everything. So that was really, really big for me um, from an inspiration standpoint, just to have them believe in me, but also hear them say, here's how I did it. Here's where I'm at now and why. So without a shadow of doubt, my mom and dad for sure, as, as cliche as that is, but um, they have raised me to do the extra stuff, work hard, be myself, and everything else will fall into place. So, another good question. Okay, sure. Last three questions for episode 100. Man, congrats again. It's big, man. It's big. Louis Imperiali wants to know, how did you come up with the idea for your podcast, and where did you start looking for people to have on the show? You already know, man. That is because we want to know. Louis Imperiali, um, a recent Sherman the Booth guest, lead singer of Fifth Lucky Dragon, and now a collaboration um, with one of our Lavender Group artists. We've got a beautiful song coming for you guys. But, Louis, great question, man. Um, where did I come up with the idea for the podcast, and how do I get guests for it? Um, like I kind of said earlier in the episode, radio and television personality has always been a major passion of mine. Um, it's not that I wanted to be on the big screen. It's just that I love sharing conversations with people on an interpersonal and, and you know close conversation. And it's so much more fun for both parties when it is that one-on-one -on -one experience. So that was why I started doing it, Louis. It was because I knew that there were people out there that share the same love for music and talking about it as me. And like I said, I grew up in a small town in Indiana. There wasn't a lot of electronic music lovers. There were, but not like me, right? So when I came to Chicago, 
couldn't believe the amount of people that were going to these. Like when I said I went to Spring Awakening, you know, there's fucking 100,000 people there like raging. And I'm like, fuck yeah, this ain't fucking Indianapolis, you know? Love Indianapolis, but you know what I'm saying. Lewis lives in Indianapolis and I know he agrees with me on this. Um, it's just a totally different world. So it's been crazy because that's been the best part about it is being able to kind of filter people out and fill them in with people who do share that same love and passion and music with me. So that's why I do it. It's just to meet more people who love the same things as me. How I find guests for the show, it started off a lot different than it is now. Um, started off, like I said, I would look at local lineups, I would message people, I kinda had a sell. I would get their number, I would try and get a warm lead, hey, I know this person, they gave me your number, I have this podcast, right? And for a while, I didn't have really any legitimacy, I wasn't getting a lot of plays, I certainly wasn't getting big artists, um, and I was really just selling myself in this experience, and I still am, but as it continued to build and I got better artists, then I kinda got a resume, I got a little collateral, hey, here's a link of what an episode looks like. Um, so it, it's changed a lot. Now um, people are interested in coming on the show and I'm able to take more chances with people of maybe a higher echelon or responsibility profile. And now we just got a big list of people that I really wanna have on the show. And it's a two way street. When people reach out to me, it's usually mutual. And yeah, we'll see how things continue to change. But awesome question, man. And it was great to have you on the show too. Okay, Jerem, I really wish I could answer this one because this is all Miami. Huh? Here we go, ready? At AO Official, another official. I like these guys, huh? What kind of tacos do you like and what kind of tortilla? We want to know. My boy's AO. I got a feeling this was Eric, but it could have been James because they both love tacos. Um, what kind of tacos do I like and the type of tortilla? <laughs> First off, can we just all agree on something that Chipotle is not Mexican food, okay? So just stop with that. I would say, man, I love some barbacoa. Flour tortilla? Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to eat a taco after this. God damn. Ayo, Ah, why did you have to ask me that question? Now I'm so hungry. But barbacoa, that's how you do it. Although Al Pastor is, of course, fire, and I know that's their answer. But I would say barbacoa and a flour tortilla. So this is the last question, man. It's the last question. Give us all you got, man. All 100 episodes in one answer. Here we go. This one comes from at Charlie Rocco. He wants to know, man. And I want to know. The people want to know what are the biggest takeaways you've gotten from the scene and your interviews, man. Because we want to no. That is me. Charlie Rocco, my man C Train. What a great guy. Um, he was so much fun to interview. And a, another great guy uh, from the scene, the community get down. Shout out to 1111 and Steven Royale um, for putting on incredible events up at Replay in Lincoln Park. I got a chance to sit down with Mr. Rocco himself. And um, some of the biggest takeaways are how incredible people are here in the scene. It's one thing to not be from Chicago or from Chicago and go, Chicago's great, Chicago's this, right? Like from a music perspective, Chicago's the home of house music. But a takeaway is that you gotta go a little bit deeper to really mean that, right? Like it's the Midwest, but Chicago is a bit of a melting pot when it comes to foreigners and all the communities here. You've got Ukrainian village, Greek town, all the Irish people on the south side, the north side, all that sort of stuff, right? Even, you know, gentrification, river north and the loop, but everybody's got their style. And I think the biggest takeaway I've had when it comes to music is that there is this common foundation of love in the Midwest and everybody's willing to lend a helping hand if, they see that you are truly passionate about it. Because there's a lot of fake people out there, but if you follow up, and if you say, this is who I am, this is why I'm doing it, this is the value that I believe I can add to your brand that I'm trying to bring to the scene, I see more of that in the Midwest than what I've heard of elsewhere in the world. So the biggest takeaway I've learned from the Chicago scene is that there are so many incredibly talented people but it's important to really learn about who they are, where they've came from, 
their journey to this point and what they're going to do in the future to continue pursuing their passion forward. So great question, my man.